<laughs> okay. Walter D'Souza graduated in 1981 from the Faculty of Fine Arts, MS University, Vadodara, with a degree in painting. He completed his MFA in 1983 from the same university in printmaking. He has been awarded the National Academy Award for Printmaking by the Lalit Kala Academy, New Delhi, in 2004. In 1995, he was nominated member Biennale Committee, Bharat Bhavan International Biennale of Prints in Bhopal. He has, he has been invited to set up the printmaking studio at Kanoria Center for Arts, which he has been in charge till 1995. Besides his site-specific commissions, his work is in the collection of the National Gallery of Modern Art Delhi, the Lalit Kala Academy New Delhi, and the British Museum in London. Thanks, Walter, for being with us. Uh, the format of this entire discussion is broken up into four sort of broad thematics that the reviewers have identified. So what we are going to do is, uh, with each thematic, the students have been put in that category. They will be making a seven minute presentation. So for example, the first group, one student will come, seven minute presentation, likewise three students, and then we open for a question and answer. If the reviewers have any specific questions to ask the student after their presentations, they are free to ask. But the open discussion happens after the three have presented. Uh, I request uh, Shrinivas Murthy to outline the four themes that uh, uh, that were discussed yesterday. Thanks, Jinas. Thank you, Sudhish. Um, and so nice to be here along with all the students, and also very nice to be back in the region. Um, and also, very happy that I have got similar language. My colleagues here. Um, so, yesterday we had a good time going through all the presentations which were put up in the exhibition. And uh, of course, we could see that this wide range of topics, uh, I wouldn't say wide range of projects, but it's the wide range of issues that some of you guys have tried to address. And uh, we have kind of identified four broad zones which most of these projects fall into. Um, of course, one is, is very prominent that way the large number of them are dealing with uh, communities. So I'm not saying that it is something to do with talking about community engagement, but it is something to do with communities of different types. So that's one broad parameter we have identified. The second one, uh, which has come up pretty obviously, is something to do with climate, sustainability, environment concerns. Uh, in a very broad perspective, not again just about climate change or energy uh, preservation or green savings and taxes, but issues related to climate, environment, and sustainability. And third, uh, which is what I think all three of us, you know, agreed at once, because none of us are from Mumbai in that sense, and which I guess all of you who are from Mumbai have a very, it comes to you very naturally to look at the urban heritage, and especially the industrial sectors of the past which are now embedded right in the heart of your city. So how you guys are looking at the evolution of your city and how these sectors are coming into that picture. So that's a very interesting aspect which I found. So that's the third category where we have got some of these projects which are talking about urban heritage, the adaptive use of it, and you know, trying to create public realm around that. So that's the third one. And the fourth one, uh, which I'm not too sure how to classify that, but they're purely architectural experiments or uh, that's the issues. Uh, so that, but they also come up with very interesting dimensions in terms of thinking about architecture. And like for me, the lecture we had today, I think suddenly we realized that are we really talking about or teaching the right things? I and mean, should we be talking about now looking at architecture completely differently? But in that sense, some of you guys have picked up these topics which are very interesting to look at. So that's the fourth category. So these are the four broad, uh, you know, zones that we have identified, and I would, I'm sure, be looking forward to the presentations of the selected few. Uh, I would request my other colleagues to just say a few words about initial thoughts about what you felt about the whole collection of the projects. Uh, 
I think what these uh, projects also talked about was something that you know the done as a student and it would be interesting how you see these projects for you again after six months. So I think that would be very interesting. Uh, we have identified the kind of projects that we thought were interesting. There are some which had tremendous intentions. So I think most of the projects were very, very uh, loaded with intention, if I can say. And uh, sometimes we felt that uh, we were too loaded, maybe, and hence uh, difficult for us to understand which is too famous. So, Pavana said, we go off somewhere, and uh, you know, you feel that uh, maybe uh, your, your proposition was, was even more uh, sound to be on this list, but maybe we couldn't get into this. Two panels may be not enough for the kind of complexity you are addressing. So, great, let's look at all of your works. Okay, uh, we will begin the uh, first session. Uh, it's uh, those projects that uh, work with communities. Uh, there are three projects here. Uh, first one is by uh, uh, Asta, second one is uh, by her. and the third one, if you can raise your hands, the first is you don't know you yet, that's uh, Asta. And uh, Anushka, yeah. Asta Yokos. Thanks.
After hearing numerous stories about Buster from my grandfather, I decided to revisit the place for my thesis. The thesis talks about how Buster is a land of perceptions and how we exoticize the tribal community because of their art and culture and at the same time villainize them by looking at them as possible insurgents. The thesis tries to look at how architecture can help in rearranging desires, not only our desires, but also the desires of the tribal community. Buster district is located in the southern part of Chhattisgarh and Jagdalpur is the administrative headquarter of the district. Looking at the conflicted past of the region briefly, there's a history of continuous attacks on the people of Buster that started even before the British took over. Forests, which were a critical aspect of life here, were being exploited by the colonial government without any regards to the locals. Looking at the nuances of life in the city, some of the important uh, regions of the city. Uh, the main road, which is a major tourist attraction with the Dalpat Sagar Lake and the Danteshwari Devi Temple, who is the presiding goddess of the region. The Frezapur region, which is the administrative area. The local architecture of Bastar, which, is la which largely consists of wood, mud and stone. The thesis tries to look for voices in the region, analyzing the existing institutional modes of speaking. Each of these institutions are analyzed in terms of the people that, are, that they are speaking for, the medium of speaking and their audience. Uh, each of these buildings are also analyzed for the spaces that enable the interaction between the tribal community and the outsider. The district library, which hosts language festival and thus represents the voices of the tribal community. The Prakhar Samachar, which is a tribal newspaper. The Chetna Women and Child Welfare Society, which speaks for the tribal community. The Forest Department, which tries to associate with the local tribal community. The Jagdalpur Legal Aid Group, which represents the voices of the tribal community and fights for the people wrongly accused in Naxal related cases. The Tourism Department, which engages in community based tourism in the region. Uh, the Anthropological Museum, which later became the main area of study, I've tried to question the idea of museum and its definition as to what is of value, who decides value, why are the things displayed, removed from the natural surroundings, and so on. Looking for voices through various material cultures and through institutions that the tribal community has made for themselves. Ghotul, which is a youth hostel for adolescents where various life skills are taught. Buster Heart, which happens in every village, is an integral part of the vibrant culture of, uh, of the district. Mandai, which is a local fair and festival celebrated in honor of the local deities of the village. The Devgodi, which um, or the sacred groove, uh, which are dedicated patches of lands of forest to deities and spirits. 
coming back to the question of the thesis that is how do we non coercively rearrange desires not not just our desires but that of the tribal community i tried to look at the idea of education in the institutions analyzed earlier and have subsequently tried to create spaces where the ideas of education of the subaltern and the so called educator are challenged looking at the idea of the participatory museum as opposed to the traditional museum uh the site which uh, has the existing anthropological museum uh mapping out the activities that happen on the site uh i started with the idea of circles since a lot of existing tribal institutions were planned in circles also looking at aldo van eyck's diagram of the otolo circle where he speaks how a circle represents a community and how an open circle represents him things coming in and going out i've tried to weave uh, every day into the site um multiplying the circles depending on the programs and thus getting multiple open circles the form not only evolved in plan but also in 2 3d saucer like forms um i did some explore exploration in clay models um some sketches uh, that i did as uh, looking at how the space should look like the program the artist window which allows uh, artists the local artists and the artists from across the world to interact the memory lab which which is a community based installations where anyone can preserve a memory uh, which may be in a written form or anything and it becomes an exhibit for the for the others to see the typewriter room where uh, people uh, where people can uh, think and contribute to the museum the tree museum which um, which is a dedicated uh, landscape work and yeah the human library um, where in uh, a human becomes instead of a book a human becomes a library uh, a, a human becomes a book for someone else the empathy alley where uh, the silhouettes of local tribal figures are kept and um, their speeches are uh, displayed the sorry tree where visitors are uh, reinforced with the importance of the word of apology the conflict timeline uh, which uh, showcases the timeline of the conflict the moral compass where which has the constitution and people can choose how they want to interact with it um so this is the plan um so i've tried to uh, um i've tried to uh uh um uh, make a spell the building tries to spell out from its side as opposed to the traditional institutional buildings which have which uh, has boundaries around it this is the main entrance to the site the khoj courtyard which has the artists workshops the gad kaleva courtyard which is um, which is a community uh, kitchen uh we have the, uh, i have the participatory gardens around it Uh, the sobhagi courtyard which has the human library the office for outreach programs the memory lab and the typewriter room and a garden library adjoining it uh, the bastar hart courtyard which has the bastar hart the patrakarata courtyard which um, which involves community based journalism the mahua courtyard which is built around a mahua tree and the activities um, associated with the processing of mahua happen here uh artists accommodation which uh, adjoins an existing hotel the coach courtyard for performing arts and the balwadi courtyard the tree museum so this is a section through the sobhagi courtyard um a section through the coach courtyard and the gad ka leva courtyard the section through the mahua courtyard and the patrakarata courtyard and the sobhagi courtyard um a section through the bastar hart courtyard uh this is a aerial view of the building i've also tried to look at how these courtyards can be used um 
uh, for temporary functions like uh, uh, hosting outdoor classrooms, play area, temporary healthcare, marriages and functions, Mandai, which is a tribal festival, animal fights, and Murya Darbar, which is another tribal festival. Um, so uh, the structure uh, is a brick corbel structure with bricks laid on edge, a terracotta co uh, with a RCC ring being around it, um, and tension cables through the bricks. Uh, yeah, these are some of the details from the spot section. Uh, this is a spot section from uh, from a cutout uh, that happens because of the presence of a tree. The cutout, uh, which also becomes an entrance. Uh, this is a section through uh, uh, when two source, when the two sources meet. And the smaller uh, ends of the saucer become spaces for exhibition. A section through the uh, through the constructed water body. Uh, looking at the uh, uh, fenestration, which is uh, uh, I've tried to look at the availability and the skills required in each of these cases. And the planting layout trees become a very important part of the project since trees are worshipped here. So yeah, looking at each of these trees in detail and then coming up with the planting layout. That's it. Thank you. Are there any specific questions for Maskaran?
Hello everyone, my name is Bebov and uh, thank you for having me here and I hope uh, I have a great discussion with all, all of you. So uh, please keep the questions ready, I'll be really excited. So, so the topic of my thesis is scrutinization of the familial sensitivity in Mumbai. Our daily lives are influenced not only by the individuals whom we share a home as a family, but also by the people in our immediate surroundings. These affiliations become an important and important support structure for people living within city, binding them together against living alienated lives, which is, to, which is to be termed as the familial. Mumbai is a concoction of these spaces, but with time and urban sprawl, it hasn't led to housing which reflects familial values. Instead, it is created for other various economy, political pressure, which shifts from the focus. The thesis aims to conserve familial spaces by examining how familial living systems have evolved into a tool for comprehending spaces. It's divided into two chapters, hypothesis and application. Starting with the first chapter, that is understanding the postulation of familial. So familial meaning re relating, to, re uh, relating to a relationship like family, where it is explained through a basic example of a jar representing community, the pebbles of different shapes and sizes and forms, representing the, uh, rep representing the idea of households and the sand between them, holding them and binding them together, representing the idea of familial. Uh, understanding the components and the difference between the household and the families, which has the characteristics like incompatibility in marriage, uh, and between family members, gender inequalities, generation gap, uh, where the idea of familial shuns these characteristics. Okay? And with the idea of familial shuns these characteristics and promotes the idea of social interactivity between different people of age group, gender, and interaction, irrespective of different various communities. Further understanding the idea of community and, and the relationship between familial and the space making. Uh, understanding the four basic structural domains of the living systems. It is critical to examine uh, the various forms of housing in Mumbai in order to comprehend the characteristics and concepts that were adopted in response to changing environments and to the conditions of the people, which led to the six different settlements in, in history. Further, it, break, it, it, it has been breaking down, broken down into three uh, variant characteristics, which is set, settlement at master scale, building household and, uh, at mezzo scale, and familial space itself as micro scale. And starting, uh, all the learning from the postulation is scrutinized through site study of four settlements in Mumbai. First site type is Koliwada. Koliwada, which literally means a home exposed to the sea, is defined by the fusion of their work, live typologies along the Mumbai show when they perform their craft. The documented familial space, spaces are roofed corridors, elevated multipurpose plinths, spaces around religious spaces, uh, narrow and intimate spaces outside the households, Threshold spaces like verandas, porches, spaces as a part of religious institutions, various other sensory features, multi typology open spaces. Coming on to the next typology, coming on to the next side that is a Gautam. It's in Mumbai, Kotachi Wadi is a living example of a resident led a legacy. It com continues to symbolize the dynamic and the long lasting interaction between, um, in, uh, between users, communities in. in uh, is legend is legend to a neighbor's physical element and cultural development. Kotachi Wadi is like heaven on earth, quoted by one of the editorial members. Documented familial uh, familial spaces are certain community features, household ot otla spaces, por porches, junctions, narrow street spaces, and etc. These particular spaces have been decrypted into a series of mapping to understand how these spaces are formed, and further few of the families and the people living in it. Coming on to the next housing typology, that is a David Parsi colony. It is located in South Bombay in the Dadan Matunga Wadala area. It was created as a city expansion tactic by the British during the Black Death Scorch. It is, it is notable for its open plan standard that limit building heights. It is built around five gardens connected by tiny interviewing well paved pathways. The documented familial space for multi typology, formal, functional open spaces and gardens, common public gathering spaces and plazas, architectural master planning features and community programs, 
spaces within the boundary of the plots like setbacks, backyards, entrances, multi-behavioral threshold spaces on the facade like balconies, terraces, etc. Similarly, these also have been decrypted into site strategies and further documenting one of the one of the buildings and understanding the various familial spaces and also documenting various families and the people living there. Similar. Further talking about the evolution of the structure, responding to the introduced. Um, this chapter talks about the fourth site that is the cluster of Chols called BDD Chols, also being the intervention site. In Mumbai's chaotic area of habitats, the Bombay Development Department erected 121 BDD Chols at in, Mumbai, in Voli between 1920 to 28 to offer low cost housing for, employ for employees in areas of industries which were initially developed. As a, as a part of jails during independence. Documented familial spaces are multi-scale spaces like courtyards between chawls, setbacks, pocket call, pocket cons, etc. Multifunctional spaces spread across the master site, in between transitional spaces and tree shade plants, common daily li uh, livable programs, community festive occasions collaborate in various community sensitive spots, communal and religious spots as, as uh, statues or Public constructed spaces, common gathering platforms or seating spaces being communal or non-communal, and chawl threshold spaces. Similarly, uh, decrypting the idea of familiar, uh, familiar in, in form of mapping. Zone A, which uh, inhabits what chawls from 1 to 20, was known as, as is my micro intervention, and further understanding the familiar in the chawl chawl structure itself. And documenting and understanding the adaptable nature of the household itself. Further understanding the relationship between chores, caste, and communities. And what what are the culpable factors which led to the various rights as a timeline between in the in BDT chores in the history? So in this chapter, the idea of pattern language was used. Pattern language became the tool of translation for narratives documented within for the site study, which turned into a glossary of diagrams inspired from Christopher Alexander's pattern language. It was divided into three scales. First being the master scale, it is categorized into street networks, common seating spaces, open spaces, and other element spaces. Coming on to the meso scale, starting with the common seating spaces, open spaces, and other religious spaces. Coming on to the final scale, that is the micro scale, uh, it has one typology that is the household threshold spaces into multiple forms and <laughs> The next chapter talks about the concept evolution and the process of pre-design. The site itself comes under the section of 339B, which talks about the reconstruction or redevelopment of cluster of BDD chores under uh, urban renewal schemes. This is an existing site section of the uh, and the 3D visualization. This is the proposed 3D uh, pre proposed site section and the 3D development done by the state government, which is very biased in terms of the site itself and not giving proper advantage to the people living there since many many decades. And this is the kind of initial kind of section which was developed in order to ex to uh, to develop the idea of giving equal equal opportunities to the people. This itself is the familiar diagram, and this itself this itself became the inspiration for the master planning. So that's how the master planning diagram develops. And coming on to the idea of sketching and idea of form exploration, spatial spatial exploration, and which developed into three different grids. That is master grid of 18 meters. Meso grid as six meters and micro grid as three meters. Coming on to the idea of sectional exploration and how these spaces can be used, and how how these build how these individual blocks of uh, of uh, of households can form a, a different kind of uh, plans with respect to black and white kind of form exploration system, and these uh, these uh, forms were explored through on a wide scale in order to understand the spaces that can be developed out of which few of these uh, modules were selected. To be, to be moved ahead with and coming on to the master planning and programming it is divided into primary program and secondary programs coming on to the intervention site that is the micro zone site a talking about the scale of the site then then accommodating the mega structure the vehicular access small scale industries formal stories formal stores learning centers and open plug-in market and talking about the ground plane itself Considering the existing vegetation, the ground plane is populated with familial spaces, as we, as you will see in the uh, pattern language in the further slides, in order to create a very cohesive ground plane, with, uh, irrespective of the buildings on the top. Coming on to the modular grid of 18.6 and 2 meters, 
coming on to the multiple uh, multiple elements of the master plan itself which starts from the typology one that is community centric typology equally spread out along this whole along the whole master plan second typology buildings uh, being sec single loaded corridor third being double loaded corridor and the general circulation course connected connecting all the three typologies together and also be uh, in accordance with the fire regulations and uh, since the site is quite large and it uh, uh, holds a lot of communities specially designed so community staircases were developed in order to connect the uh, connect the buildings of multiple communities uh, creating the idea of vertical street network such that the ground plane multiplies vertically also in order to create cohesiveness along the flow plates creating terraces and in idea in order to create this idea of coming to be together of typologies it was developed further addressing the idea of north light terracing south wind west terracing and south east terracing and that's how the whole uh, basic massing of the site is developed coming on to the main important part of this uh, argument that is the process of housing delivery that is housing allocation the existing process this existing mode of house, housing allocation that is a randomized street system they just need to give a proof that the family is living as a resident in bdd chol since 1990s and through a randomized street system these guys will be allocated the kind of household that they have to but what are the what are the drawbacks of this particular process it incre increases individualism which is currently not practiced over here no consideration of the residents res residents needs no understanding of community community's behavior and other factors what who are the supporters of the de redevelopment and the oppositions and this is one of the one of the very viral uh, kind of a headlines that has been documented which is with state government's redevelopment plan for mumbai's bdd chol is it time to let go of a familiar way of life so my kind of proposed process which for acad academic purpose i have been i am calling it as form follows preference it has been divided into four various factors four various steps so starting with the idea of online shopping where the person is able to choose the kind of size the position and the uh, and the location of the dwelling with respect to the household selection and customization of the house according to the kind of people living within it within it number of people living within it and the opportunity to give them the idea of rating the shared and the communal spaces and the participation within it and the fourth one be, being the technical part of it starting with the first step it start with giving them the three broad aspects of this uh, typologies giving them the features like dom domains of living facing directions of the module density and other features so that allows them to select the kind of typology they want to do further giving them the locations of the different typologies on the site which they can explore and according to the advantages of the transportation and the nearby uh, nearby aspects they can have a pop, uh, the choice of the building and after the choice of the building they can say, select the preferred direction in vertical aspect and horizontal aspect further in order to coming onto the micro scale that is the household itself they get a wide range of possibilities to select from the modules that have you see, that, that you have seen in the previous exploration with respect to different sizes where each size gives them different options of uh, programs like sleeping spaces sanitation spaces and etc and along with that attaching the familial in order to create a proper household with which creates different kinds of typologies between all of them and a next step talks about the selection of configuration which is vertically stacked or horizontally planned and allowing them to create a create a uh, rating of what kind of participation they want to have with the community at the neighbor, neighborhood level and this is the basic preview of the module module where which they can try kind of customize it later and a, a, a six step process which allows them to choose a different kind of fenestration for each each kind of program that they are that they require so this is just an example of but uh, it's just an example of how different program like for a cooking space it can be done and for a common space and this is the final preview of the model which gives them the satisfaction it can be uh, it can be made into a modular construction come coming on to the components of master plan the uh, the start starting with the housing typology one it's a it's a community centric typology where the me mega structure is surrounded around and all the it creates four different surfaces for the modules to be attached by this by as they have selected in the previous process giving them a centric kind of a, a community centric kind of a, a typology and these are the few flow plans that have been explored in order to show that each and every flow plan gives you different kind of possibilities for depending on the household that they have developed on their own choices and the spaces that are formed through a sec sectional exploration we can see how the different houses are stacked on each other to create multiple organic kind of community and neighborhood spaces and the corner junctions being the shared spaces between the neighbors a section cutting through the central uh, uh, open part and the section other uh, section from the other side through showing the terracing 
and section showing the multiple uh, steps, step communal spaces and niche shared spaces. Coming on to the synthesis drawing of this uh, typology, it, uh, this uh, this drawing particularly tries to show the different kinds of stackings that can be done, which has been evolved into multiple types of uh, uh, housing ho housing that being possible. That is, it gives these uh, possibilities like terrace and staggered balconies and different kinds of households that has been developed. The different features like common terraces, corner terrace junction, um, visual connectivity of the movement, overlooking step terraces, shared double height terraces shared common terraces and pocket common terraces and the various other different kinds of households that people can can develop into. Coming on to the structural part of it, so it starts from the ground level and each and every element has been explored over here on how to create a uh, idea of mega structure to complete sort of sturdy uh, mega structure which allows them to explore and give them multiple faces for attaching them uh, the, the households like starting from the lowest part then raising the columns and creating these anchorage walls, which allows them the uh, possibility to attach the households, depending on the location, structural section through the mega structure and section through the uh, internal courtyard, showing how the mega structure relation of mega structure with the households, so certain details and sort of share uh, the details of the shared spaces. Coming on to the smallest module structure that was uh, previously evolved in the form for this preference idea, every single element has been uh, uh, developed over here in order to create a, a very stable kind of a modular construction. And finally, this, uh, this diagram shows the connection of the module to the mega structure and how it's done. Coming on to the next type housing typology, that is double loaded typology. Similarly, it starts with a center mega structure on, two, on both the sides on east and west direction, giving a centrally corridor, central corridor and a households on both the sides. Similarly, plan for, for all of them section showing the central corridor space. Coming on to the next typology, that is single order typology. I'll just move by. That is good. We got it. Good. So, circulation course, then coming on to the idea of pattern language. Yeah, that I think you can explain that master don't run so much. Okay. Explain it to us. Okay. So uh, the pattern language that was initially developed as a site strategy was converted into contextual based pattern language in order to create the three different kinds of scale that is master scale, which has these uh, particular components of the ground floor plan. And coming on to the meso scale, that is a typology itself to create multiple uh, uh, multiple uh, uh, like Typologies for the shared spaces. Coming on to the micro scale itself. And this is one just a demonstration of how one of the particular communities can be can actually adapt to the typologies of the of, from, from the whole site, showing this uh, community centric typology and the two typologies connecting towards it and the community side staircase as well as well. A physical model and the different views of the site coming onto the master plan and how the plan develops and terraces onto the upper floor plans. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, as in like for academic purpose, that was a basic initial idea, but uh, this kind of idea can be obviously developed in future for other uh, other contexts, depending on the context itself, because this app was particularly developed for this site because depending on the size of the module modules the people living and all the conditions but this type this kind can be also be developed for other places as well so uh, 
that was my first question. Okay. The second question is that uh, we talked about the code for which this unit is yes. you know, this by reference I would choose to the app and I get attached to it. Yes. yes. So from a technology perspective, what do this get done? I mean, is this unit going to be pre-fabricated and isolated as well and you break it down? Yes. Or does it happen like a pre-construction stage, you finish the whole application? You know what we need to build and then you build it. it so I'll just explain it quickly. So the idea of dividing the whole structure into mega structure, which is responding to the context and the site itself, developing that and then come giving them the process to to allow them to build the households and then it gets connected. So the junction is basically developed as a as a purpose of anchorage walls, such that it gives them the it gives them the flat surface where you can. What stage I have been mentioning is the program is it choices that I'm making? Okay, okay. Is it before construction or is it also during construction so that I have a module which is ready somewhere else? Mm -hmm. Depending on at what okay. point of time I make the choice, the unit comes in and does this. Or okay. is it a pre programmed choice which I would make? Close the program part and then the construction schedule. Uh, so basically, the mega structure part is initially designed by the architects. Once that design is done, they can develop the conditions for the form follows preference as an app. And by the time the construction of the mega structure is happening, these guys can get the preference and the module modular construction can start on the other side, such that by the time the mega structure is ready, both of them can get attached. So, what do you there's another fight. Same thing. There's another fight. Yes. The US line, there is a Okay, can we focus? Yes, well. Good morning, everyone. I'm Anushka Kulkarni, and I'm deeply honored to be here presenting my thesis to all of you today. Uh, my thesis is titled Walking Back Home, a case of Pandharpur uh, through the arrival of the Wari. The town of Pandharpur lying along the river Chandravaga is a well-known shooting town in Maharashtra. It has emerged as the main center of worship of Lord Vithal. Every year during the months of Asha, June, July, about a million people march on foot in groups called Dindis to Pandharpur in honor of the deity carrying the Paduka of various saints and palanquins from their respective shrines. Completing a distance of about 250 kilometers in 21 days, the Varkaris reach Pandharpur on the day of Ashari to take the darshan. So, Wari is derived from the word war, meaning a period, period of time. Therefore, Wari means the periodic congregation at, at a certain place, taking place uh, four times a year, and denotes one who does, and the Varkari denotes one who does or performs the Wari. This shows the cycle of uh, the Wari happening throughout the year. Uh, Scheduled at the end of the Kharif and Ravi cropping season or sowing season, the Ashari or the Kartiki Wari marks the completion of an important agricultural cycle and signifies the commencement of a new seasonal cycle. Thus, relieved from the occupational duties, Bhaktas from Pune, Maratwada, and Vidarbha rejoice by participating in the Palki. 
The three week travel is punctuated by stops at key points where the Bhaktas replenish their energies and local communities absorb them in a variety of economies. Respondents also recognize this as a set of values and practices pervading the everyday, as a force determining every moment, whether to the Deepthak Kshetra or the Shet. Thus, uh, Wari, the pilgrimage, serves as a broad social landscape for the Varkari or the pilgrim to articulate and enact their agency in different contexts through the act of walking back home to the abode of Hari. As one looks closely at the architecture of the town, one sees soft nuances of welcoming gestures portrayed throughout the built forms that hint at making the pilgrim feel comfortable and at ease in the new town. Through this, the thesis uh, aims to clarify Pandharpur's locative and builds the context for the examination of the Wari through the metaphor of the home to understand how the town is experienced and being constructed simultaneously. The, three, the study looks at three different scales of the home and how the town internalizes uh, the home and spatializes it in the built form. The first one looks at the local residences' houses and how changes are made inside to sort of accommodate the pilgrim, where changes are made to the toilets, existing toilets. Two kitchens are operational in the house, one for the Varkaris and one for their own sort of staying. Uh, the floors are tiled for them to stay comfortably. Uh, the action of providing shelter to the Varkari dissolves the whole idea of ownership and opens the door to all. The second uh, sort of uh, scale looks at the mutt as an institutionalized home and how it opens out to communities not only to educate but also to provide shelter. And the third one being the empty medans that become temporary shelters for them to stay. Uh, my site uh, is the Maidan. So this whole idea distinguishes itself from the idea of mere hotels or that also provide for, but the home that also seems to care for, this establishing a familial bond between the pilgrim and the resident that builds a relationship of giving and receiving from both ways. Uh, it enables the land to be seen not just as a property line, but as a set of relations that establishes themselves as people come together. Uh, the land use mapping of the site was done to understand what is the uh, fabric of the town. And a major difference was seen between the left and the right, which is the left being more uh, sort of built and the right one being more agrarian and open. So the Maidan was seen, uh, the 65 acre plot, which was given for the Varkaris to stay, was looked at as a major intervention to sort of decongest the existing sort of uh, pilgrim land and see that as a potential to making it a larger public space. Uh, the evolution of the land was sort of looked at of how after it was allocated as the land for encampment, uh, what kind of infrastructure sort of got built. So an MTTC resort and uh, huge toilets, about 200 uh, sort of toilets were scattered in bulk across the entire land. You can see the smaller ones uh, which are highlighted there. So this was the site with the uh, infrastructure shown as below. So uh, the mapping uh, of the site was looked at through these uh, sort of different ways of how does the pilgrim create space through walking, dwelling, cooking, serving, performing, and what kind of infrastructure does that lead to? Uh, so the a mapping was done to understand how the uh, I mean how the land was constructed and deconstructed within a week's time by individual dindis according to the resources available, creating a huge encampment of tents that sort of looked at the electricity grid, land allocation, zoning, et cetera, sanitation systems. It was great opportunity to see the, to see the land as a larger public space that would lessen the load on the main city by diverting the public here. Uh, Various stakeholders were actually identified across various sort of uh, stress points that were emergent through the activity mapping. And uh, since the, the whole idea was to see it as a way of a home, uh, the idea was of the stakeholders was looked at who is providing for and what is who is being hospitable. So the, it was looked at through the idea of the residents, the earth itself, and government. The... the 
the residents of the town uh, sort of uh, the relationships were con conceptualized through the relationships formed with the ones providing mainly the government that provides for the permanent sort of interventions, the residents that provide for the temporary ones and keep the economic cycle uh, going on uh, with the varkaris and the earth itself that sort of keeps changing seasonally. So a larger uh, sort of uh, programmatic, programmatic diagram was made to plug into the all the uh, public sort of activities and government schemes and awareness campaigns that were sort of would aid in the uh, in the establishment of these programs on this site, uh, majorly looking at women uh, women empowerment centers through the Nirmal Wari or the Harit Wari or the Wari Tichi. Uh, as known as uh, under the Beti Bachao, Beti Padhao scheme or the Swachh Bharat Abhiyan that looks at toilets and uh, sort of uh, the biogas plants. Moving ahead, how the site was looked at uh, through two major points, the left side being uh, talking about the, the follies that would scatter all across the land as smaller interventions. And on the right side, as one sort of larger intervention that plugs onto the site that keeps bringing in people throughout the year when the site is not uh, active with the varkaris. So the site was, uh, this is the site plan with the ground cover, then the tracing out the points of higher elevation, uh, road, roads were marked out through those points, across those points, and a geometry was formed that would uh, lay the diagram for the roads that would sort of intersect on the existing plan. Uh, a grid was uh, formed according to the east-west direction in which uh, the temple was also sort of directing itself. Uh, a grid of uh, follies was spread across. Uh, initially, it was conceptualized as toilets. The, the existing plan consisted of toilets, but uh, I thought that water could be an integral part of attaching itself as a central focal point. This is the final master plan with all the follies scattered around and the main sort of uh, in public intervention, which is the seed bank and the Krishi Vigyan Kendra right in the center are along the Medan. So the first intervention looked as the water folly. Uh, uh, architecturally, this was meant to uh, act as points of re references throughout the landscape. So when one moved a kilometer inside this landscape, he would know he, he would know that he has walk, I mean, uh, walked a kilometer after he has passed each of these. So these were points of references throughout the landscape. So he could one could locate oneself inside this larger mass of uh, the Medan. Uh, the follies are made from uh, tin, uh, corrugated tin sheets and the doors were sort of looked at to understand how uh, local uh, material could be re-looked at. Uh, the plan sort of uh, basically look, these are smaller follies with a water pipe right in the center where people can come and wash their utensils and connect a pipe probably outside and wash in a larger quantity if the need be. Uh, in case of the rest of the year, the Follies could be closed, but access from the pillion could be accessed from uh, the outside externally as people walk through this landscape traversing uh, and these could act as points of rests. The second intervention was a community temporary tent, which would uh, enable uh, sort of various uh, people to sort of uh, do donations Nadan, or set up medical camps in case the need be. Uh, the, the tents weren't that because people would carry them by themselves. And this was uh, uh, an intervention that would keep cyclically uh, running throughout the year by the residents of the town itself, keeping the economic cycle alive. And these could be, this was bamboo with cloth and uh, could be easily dismantled and put up again year after year. The third one was looking at the seed bank, which was the major sort of seed bank and uh, the seed bank and the Krishi Vigyan Kendra, which acts as centers of knowledge and also as uh, something that people keep coming or coming to every year. The whole idea of this was that uh, 
people from various sort of uh, lands are walking up to this destination and they could carry with them carry them carry with them the seeds the regional seeds that they sort of themselves use in their own lands and then this becomes as a repository for these indige indigenous seeds to sort of uh, be stored and then learned from and uh, basically a conversation about regional foods can be uh, continued the ground floor also opens out to sort of mark to accommodate markets and agricultural fairs. Yes, thus this thesis sort of looks at how architecture should provide no more and no less and assist a man's homecoming. And it really questions the idea of how much is enough and what all could be sort of catered to. Thank you. Thank you. If you would like, there are varied projects that we have looked at, uh, looking at uh, the idea of community and interpreting that community and creating architecture. The other one talks about the idea of participation and the making of the project, and uh, hence the idea of control, which is not extremely helpful, to questioning. Shows us that, that how do we look at a, a thematic understanding and uh, maybe try and find that some kind of thread that goes architecture as as we to to look at the idea of control because that is what is uh, and changing in each one. What what do you say as an idea? They are not necessarily looking at each project but as a idea of community and architecture and the idea of the It's interesting uh, the way you put it, um, especially in reference to the second project where you're talking about. Uh, architect trying to get control. Uh, in fact, my impression was that it was the other way around, where uh, he was he is trying to say that the control is actually on the guy who's going to take up the unit, and he decides what kind of a unit you want. So in that sense, what we had this whole discussion this morning about reconstructing the very idea of how to make architecture, how to make space. But that also brings in a very important question, is that then what is ultimately a community? And how does the community that is, how is a community formed and how what relationship does it have with space making or architecture? I think all these three um, pieces, I mean the big projects, demonstrate some kind of in that idea that what is a community. So, whereas I would put it this way, that the first one is talking about the space where community wants to come together. So in that sense, I have a question for um, Asna that as architects, or in your case, as a student of architects, or when you're taking up the thesis, would you define the program saying that this is what you think out of your understanding of community that they need? Or would there be a program like what I was trying to say that the people will come forward through a particular technological or any other means and decide that this is what we would like to have? Okay. And whereas you see the third one where there is an issue of temporality. Because I do not know with whom I'm going to stay even for a day or two, but my relationship does take shape in that for those two days or three days, and then it again goes back. So there are three relationships which we are talking about. So for you, the question would be, what's your take on this whole idea? But would you decide or would you like? Uh, so sometimes it would be educated some of the issues like maybe communities are not aware of how to, let's say, um, Come together for a specific purpose. Uh, in this case, when you are talking about that there's a museum, there's a need for interaction, there's a need for them to work together 
Uh, if that was the wisdom of the community, would they not have done it on their own anyway? Right. At the same time, then what is then your role as a designer, as an architect? So I think this is something which many of us need to think about. That where exactly is the architect or the designer fitting in? And I think also uh, sometimes we get into this whole debate about that what exactly is our role from a completely academic perspective, that are we as architects uh, creator of space, or let's say are we in the process of space making, or also are we in the process of social reforms, that we suddenly say that this is what the society should be like. Okay, so it's a very fine line. Uh, maybe just answer that question, that what was your idea about programming part of it, then others will you know, benefit from that. So the whole idea was, uh, I, I had started analyzing all the institutions and I had analyzing the institution that I came across the Anthropological Museum, which portrays the community in a certain way and which does not involve the community at all. The community is, um, uh, is removed uh, from its uh, natural context is what I felt. And uh, therefore the idea of participation of the uh, idea of participation of the community and of the outsider. Uh, so what I tried to do through the building is uh, I tried to create uh, spaces that allow those sort of interactions uh, as in the interaction between the community and the outsider. Uh, Anybody else wants to? Uh, the other was uh, one of the three uh, presentations fascinating. Uh, the other person is that as a student, I'm there, but uh, as soon as they already from an academic point of view, the amount of time that we get to engage with the community and whether we, have, whether we are developing methods to actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, understand what the what, what the references are. Whether we are we are having those kind of uh, tools and methods, uh, it will be to listen to communities and understand what their uh, what their requirements would be. That's a question for uh, for for all of us over there. Because uh, because I think the uh, architectural education training uh, focuses on a particular uh, dimension. Presumes that the uh, that the architect knows better. Uh, whereas the thesis is an opportunity where uh, that where there is a there is, there is some kind of a hint at challenging that particular so, And I'm just wondering whether this whether we prepare students for that or or the other. So, so exactly that's the point I was trying to raise. That what exactly are we? I mean, are we just in the realm of space making, or are we also wanting to be Social development of the sort. So, yes, so answering your question, I think this exact same thing sort of happened with me while I was doing my thesis. Initially, I had started looking through the idea of what I would need and how that could be upgraded into something much better. But as I started having more and more interactions with them, I realized that when the community itself is so organized in their own setups and in a way of sort of how they arrange their own things, that they do not need, they will not need me to intervene in what they actually have. They are actually fine with their kinds of setup. They just needed sort of additional sort of, uh, you know, reliefs in terms of simple uh, things like water and basic sanitation that could be provided for in these bands, other than sort of Building for them uh, and making sort of their lives better. So then my thesis took sort of a different turn and it sort of went uh, looking at how the government is spending a lot of money into these projects. They're building buildings of 200 projects uh, across the town, which nobody ends up using throughout the year. But so, how could the government also come and look at its own? Sort of, uh, you know, way of building up, or even to invest into what structures are to be built from these people. 
if you like to feel like a little bit of What do you want to say Okay, so I think that and you're constantly get up answers and also at the same time contradictory what um series was trying to say is that um, first that how much do we think is enough to understand the community of the Kuma actually part of? Right. Uh, I mean it's not just a question of thesis and that six months that you have, but even as architects when you when you grow up even at this stage, if I was to be so called tired by communities to design something for them. I had somehow in this world, uh, so you were trying to say that we assume that architect knows. I mean, where is that coming from? So, is there a method that we have laid for ourselves that we would go into the community and how much is enough to understand the community? Uh, typically, we have this pedagogies which are available saying you go case study and you interact with them, you record some of their responses, and then you suddenly draw those nice charts which are you know, very impressive and you claim that you know the community. But at the same time, what uh, Ganeshka was saying that it seems that they know already what they want. And I believe me, my personal opinion is that each one of us, even as communities, whether we are urban or rural or semi urban, we are all capable of creating our own spaces. We are able to, we can also fulfill our own needs. We do that on a daily basis. The question basically comes when we start looking at it from a designer perspective. We find something wrong if a farmer is able to put two or four, uh, what they call it, the tallies or the poles and put a thin shed. We don't call it architecture because somehow it doesn't fit into our sense of aesthetics, saying that there's no design in it. But from this perspective, that says design and is done it and it serves its purpose. So that's the question I think sometimes this opportunities like thesis gives you to get into that mode to debate that how much of an Intervention you are creating, which is more than what he or she or the community That's where the real designer or architect comes into play. So you are expected to provide for more in a more efficient manner, and somewhere uh, probably out of um, I would say a structured knowledge gaining system that you are also able to provide an appropriate solution, which the community or somebody else might have. Done something out of ignorance. So let's say today we can claim that asbestos is not environment friendly, but probably the farmer is not of it. So, would an architect's role be to tell the farmer that don't build it in asbestos, but please go ahead and build whatever way you want to build with something which is more environment friendly? Or would you also design that, okay, only build like this? So, I think that's an uh, issue. Uh, I just wanted to raise one more issue and then I will definitely like what to do. Uh, talk about. This whole idea of a temporality of space and our interpretation of, so it's not just about space, you know, I think, I think all these three topics also bring about the temporality of relationship. And how do you conjure that with space making? Uh, because you're talking about a center where chapels or the communities are expected to come and use, so it's not a place where they're going to live. So there is that sense of temporality there that I would come whenever I need to. Um, in the other case, like in Mavro's case, I'm curious to know when you talk about Chawal or even the other parts. I think you tend to live there longer than a week or a month or a year. It means you're going to live with families uh, where you would like to make relationship. Uh, and in the present system, there is possibility of choosing the type of relationship I would like to have. Which is where, whether we agree with it or not, it is community based, culture based, you know, such kind of an ethnicity based issues. But if I was to depend on an app to choose my neighbor uh, because of the typology of the unit I'm choosing, I'm not sure uh, where I'm going to end up with, which could be looked at as an very important and positive way of looking that I'm now going to create a community which is very homogeneous in its uh, social behavior. Uh, whereas in in uh, your case, it's the temporality of the shortest time. I mean, I just have to present that village and just go back. And uh, I, I mean, this is something which I would have expected. I'm sure they also talk about what happens those 21 days because they're also stopping time in between. So there is also space, space making happening in those 21 nights or 20 nights. So that's an interesting dimension. So there are some of the thoughts there.
Uh, when we look at the idea of participatory design, we're looking at, at and the method that you employed when I said it was that it's almost becomes a sort of architectural process in the analysis. It is only we who stay here. I also feel that there is a no contrary direction where architecture shapes us. So here, what you have taken is the idea of preference somewhere, I feel, seems to look at only a one way. Uh, communication with the idea of space. So I don't know whether you realize that uh, because the temporality is much longer, it shapes us. If I were to wear uh, something out of track and slapping over time, different things, it, it doesn't necessarily shape an architecture because I engage with something much longer, it shapes. So when, when we look at the manner in which you would progress, I felt that you need to see this architecture maybe not just as a matter which shows changes, but also as a matter that is only also is back and communicate with you. Because it, it also shapes you. So somewhere I felt that uh, it seems like you need a really directional approach that you would like this architecture. I felt it may be community. Yeah, um, thanks for your presentation. It's uh, a lot of work and uh, very good. Expressly, uh, it's been a very inspiring work. Um, but just to, I mean, also, uh, in a way, echo the comments of the viewers, um, the viewers, the discussants. Um, I feel that, you know, what um, much of this, these proposals, um, very much of both may work things. Not a field view. Um, a field view would tell you things about so called community, which is an invention that you have made in order to make these projects. Uh, the community is not what uh, you discover on the field, uh, because those communities are not only now to them. So I feel that a large part of it would be very interesting if these projects really spoke about people's methods. How did you uh, find out this and how did you find out that? What were the questions you were asking when you went on the field? Did you already know that this is what they want? Uh, did you know who is it that you're speaking to? Is it the elders of the community? Is it the, you know, the uh, uh, politically connected members of the community? Is it the people who in, in your case, for instance, the talks, you would be surprised in your uh, slide you said these are the people who are opposing the project. Uh, um, a large part of the residents of the BTU project actually supported, the BTU government is supported. And you would be surprised to know that the reason for that is not really architecture, it's square to get here that they are being offered. You know, they are very mundane facts about the world, but the world is in some sense uh, almost hostile uh, um, to the project. So you reject it yes. and you do your project anyway. So these are some things that uh, we need to really think about and make it a practice also to talk about the field much more in the presentation. Uh, this was something that even got me in a game. And it's made us the problem of it. We go again. Why do we have to have an architect? And I I lived with an architect. And I put up with an architect. And I'm going to be sick here, okay? I'm just being a matter of time. And you have to be one today. I didn't want to be one today. And you get the feeling that I really get the feeling that. All of your at high school level need to go through some basics, housekeeping. You know, and we can start addressing everything that we are talking about over here. Some real simple ways that then questions you be more asking in your studio, you ask me. You ask me to do housekeeping, and then we don't need to have it on you, and we don't need to have it in a discussion in a studio. 
to inherently abide and apply. And that's a lot, not me. Okay, this is how I feel, okay? And that's a lot of questions to be taken care of at not even an intellectual but at the, the requirements of everybody's requirements. Everybody else. And, uh, and I, I speak about this because now, in the last two years of pandemic time, why the group? You see how many spiders have webs in there? And it's between the, that group. And there are details and questions being brought up, which are questions that. It's those kinds of questions that uh, that push you, and then to keep pushing you, and there comes a point where you say, "If what we said is not clear, who is it now? Have we gone to ask this question?" And the questions are like way older. They are a lot more intense than if you start asking basic questions. I don't know. What do you think? It's fine. You pay this year to And I'm happy you have spoke up because I said, hey, it's something that we need to look at. Especially now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a very good point uh, thing about the other thing. So I was saying so observing. So this is uh, again interesting all the youngsters. I mean, we're now going to take up the next set of these stories. Uh, try to read the titles of the three projects. Okay. Uh, and this only exercise here. So one verse says architecture in the midst of conflict. Now oh, it's a really important thing. So let's look at the positive side of it. Okay. So I'll let me read the titles first. The second one is walking back home. A case of part of the arrival of Bali. And the third one says scrutinizing the familiar sensitivity in Mumbai. Not even just that part, in Mumbai. Okay. And then we also I mean, somewhere to mention incompatibility of marriage is what you're looking at. It. And then you're talking about heaven on earth. These are like three. So the first thing I understand is are we really in that stage to figure out what is mean for us? And how do we then translate that into a design brief? I mean, I couldn't understand what compatibility of marriage means even now after we are years. And here we are talking about no, but it's see the positive side of it is that I'm very happy about is that. Our mind is drawn, you know, the attention is drawn to such issues which are around us and how much they are seen, talked about, and visible to us. And we are able to, even as youngsters, able to identify that yes, these are the issues which we should be talking about and saying. Like we also had um, another issue where we talked about the crime. We yesterday had the other European men crime against women. So it's very fantastic. But then we need to understand that as architects, how do we interpret it as our scope of us and translate that into some kind of work. Then, so this is something which is um, very you know, important for all of you to think. It's important to be great, but then also trying to convert that into you know, a very small, very clear, definitive, programmable architecture. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on. We've just got time. We need to you know, the next two presentations. Uh, first is uh, Abhul, and second will be Rashmi. We're focusing on the model of the environment and climate related
Hi everyone, I'm Ahuli Sanghai and my thesis is titled Sensitivity Towards the Wildlife, a Demonstration in Mahindri Conservation Reserve. The concern largely revolved around the human and wildlife conflicts on the edges of depleting forested boundaries to maintain intergenerational equality and conserve the forest area. Necessary policies are enforced which create livelihood challenges for the communities that depend on these forests. The thesis proposes a symbiotic arrangement between the two forest and locals towards mitigating these challenges. Since there are tangible and intangible variations in forest throughout the country, it was essential to focus on a single kind of forest and a specific on the lesser known Mahendri Conservation Reserve, which receives from the state and the center. The aim is to stop the wrong at Conservation Reserve and the thesis thus explores wildlife-friendly land use architectural arrangement of programs for the MCR which are facilitated by some of these affected communities, which then also bring about additional or alternate employment opportunities. It attempts to form a model which can be adapted by forest with similar context. A forest area has a core and buffer and, and transition zone, zone, which are notified for only wildlife sanctuaries and national parks which allows tourism development and other kinds of activities in the buffer zone. It looked at the timeline trail of wildlife and forest conservation laws of India and their amendments, objectives, advantages and drawbacks only to understand that though there are these policies, the results are harmful to both communities and the forest lives, such as road accidents, poaching and crossing the blurred boundaries, yet very little facilities for the conservational activities. By introducing more responsible eyes on the forest, these situations can be altered for good. The chosen site is in Varwood, in the Amravati district. The forest lies on the borders of Maharashtra and Madhya Pradesh. It forms a wildlife corridor that connects main forest of the central Indian landscape and enables natural processes such as migration. It is important to work beyond the boundaries of the mainstream charismatic parks. There are various villages on the fringes of this reserve along with Mahendri village which lies within the forest boundaries that depend on its on the forest for its livelihood. A major state highway cuts across the forest, uh, fragmenting it into two parts. The geological studies bring about the plushness and richness of the forest in terms of flora, fauna and land features. For a resident in the Mahendri village, any possible occupation leads to danger to both the residents and the wildlife. To overcome these high risks and losses due to conflicts with wildlife, alternate livelihood opportunities that work for the betterment of the both are proposed. Managing the wildlife habitat and looking after the health of the forest, the vegetation, as well as the animals efficiently, park management programs that reimagine the role of so-called tourists and wildlife healthcare assistance are pro proposed for the forest. The thesis is an example that forms a model for forest with similar context. It prepares a toolkit, a guideline for conducting any forest management building activity in and around the forest. The toolkit is a handy A by 20 page guideline for the notified tropical dry deciduous forest of India, which is divided into three categories planning and construction process, comparison of material, and the chosen materials. Some excerpts are shown here. It analyzes the impacts of processes and materials in the environment and rates them accordingly, thus forming a material palette. Next, a wildlife crossing structure under the state highway that fragments the forest is proposed. The time in which any kind of activity in a forest takes place is a critical factor. In the technology semester, wildlife crossing infrastructure was proposed, which resulted in a research paper after certain discussions on site and with the local NGOs. This followed a fast construction process that kept in mind the larger picture of future benefits of the forest and communities. Next is a healthcare facility for injured or open wild animals. The aim of the wild care is to treat and rewild these animals and not showcase them to people. A wild care in the closest proximity and natural habitats is essential for speedy assistance and recovery along with their rewilding without which an injured animal is at risk. For the same, a site 
which has shrublands near a lake is chosen. The proposed programs would have treatment and recovery rooms managed by nearby animal science centers, doctors, students, locals, and NGOs. The site has tall trees and small shrubs, especially sal and teeth near the water body. The zoning is such that the access is provided directly to the treatment area, which is a physical divide between the carnivores and herbivores enclosures. The idea is to leave a minimum footprint by stilting the built mass and connectivity between the spaces is moved towards the periphery, which creates a buffer between the habitat space and nature, which maximizes the natural resources, such as rainwater harvesting and natural daylight. A canal is drawn from the lake to enable water flow towards the southwest and water source of the facility. On two sides of the building are the animal enclosures. The built mass forms a Z shape depending on the bare lands of the site. Let's take an example that a truck has hit a deer and the authority has been informed about the same or there's an injury on site. An appropriate vehicle approaches and brings the injured deer to the wild care. A primary checkup is carried out at the entrance. Then if required, kept in the quarantine area for disinfection. Information is registered in the admin room and the deer is a medium sized animal. It is taken to the X-ray ring for injury details. Certain tests are conducted in the research and test room over here. And then immediately taken to the uh, taken to one of the two surgery rooms for the procedure. Post surgery, it is kept under observation in the recovery room. Post primary recovery, it is housed in a herbivore's enclosure and provided for fodder, which is prepared in the top leg of the Z built form. To observe activities in and around, three machans are located in three directions. The stilt allows for natural activities to happen under it with a gentle mud roll roof on top. The canal passing from under the built space forms a calm environment for the users. The form allows for the natural processes to continue below while separating the two enclosures. The substructure and structure made in precast concrete to achieve fast construction, which is walled with locally made CSE blocks and the roof is made with locally sourced and made bamboo mud rolls and mangalore tunnels, which is also suitable for the high temperatures in the Amravati region. Yeah. The site focused on one animal deer, for instance, is in order to plan various enclosures. One of the enclosures is detailed out here. Each enclosure is made accessible by the animal ambulance, which is feeding with a feeding shelter at the back and enclosed with bamboo and gabion basket walls. Natural earth berms and plantations uh, create a divide between the two enclosures on either side. Water, waste, and energy are managed in the greenest ways possible that form mulch and reusable water for the center itself. Lastly, the Sentinel. A village forest center is a space to understand the ecosystem and guard it to reimagine the role of tourists as volunteers, forming the forest itself as a learning center. The large plot is chosen near the forest, yet closer to villages, as they are the users of the same. Topographical studies help to understand and situate the built and unbuilt programs with natural vegetation such as mauva, rita, and other forest trees growing around. The site is surrounded by farmlands, the state highway, and Varda River. Training programs are located towards the south, which are easily accessible for volunteers, whereas villages programs are on the north side, which is bridged with common program. The building section of stilt is uh, stilt and pitched roof here follow a similar ideology of allowing natural processes to continue below and the built mass is not higher than the surrounding vegetation, thus camouflaging in the landscape. The natural trails form a loop connecting every bar of the building. It allows studying the forest in the natural naturality with a machan for observation. Access is provided from the east where varied sizes of community spaces are provided for villages, children, uh, adults and volunteers. Here, an exchange of knowledge about the conservation of forests takes place, thus making it a community reserve. A nursery to study the local plants with a fitness area for the forest guards towards the west. The northern bar houses about 30 volunteers in four uh, and six sharing rooms with villagers, shops below, and a kitchen and mess area connecting the two bars. 
the built pond descends towards the entrance on the east, bowing down in front of the sentinels of the forest, the users. There are indoor and outdoor spaces loosely connected and demarcated for activities that suit the cause. The varied sizes of courtyards that form within two within the two uh, or more filled spaces collect water from the butterfly roof in the flowering patches. The stay block is a story tall with buffer spaces outside the habitat space, which create an ambience for the volunteer with the kitchen and mess block at the bottom. Uh, the multi-purpose hall and maidan and the nursery at the back abutting the highway. The construction system followed is CSE blocks, masonry precast concrete stills and bamboo structure or butterfly roofs connecting the rainwater in the middle of channel or in the middle and channeling towards the trenches. A precast plan was devised to ensure a fast construction process and indoor spaces for the exchange of knowledge and skills to make this a community reserve. Water, waste and energy are managed to use uh, to reuse in the building itself. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Drashti Shroff, and I'm thankful to get this opportunity to present and discuss my thesis topic uh, titled The Bureau of International Expositions Pavilion at the Expo 2020 in Dubai. And my research was uh, titled Ephemerality versus Monumentality of the Expo Architecture and the Legacy it Creates. Just for a little backstory before I delve right straight into the thesis, no matter how overwhelming these titles sound, the topic itself was just as overwhelming for me in the last four years that I was intrigued by the World Expos. It was almost uh, the start of second year when I learned about them in detail, and that's when I knew that, okay, this is something I'm very curious and intrigued about. World Expos are basically these global events that take place every five years in various parts of the world. And these are essentially uh, temporary events meant to last for six months. But the permanence of the architecture in these places is really questionable for a temporary event. So taking up this premise and really having like 100 questions in my mind about why and how and who, I landed up uh, making a nice long list of questions. And my research was eventually an answer to the questions. And then the design intervention kind of became a conceptual prototype proposal to solve the problems of these questions. So uh, just basically giving an overview of the various institutions involved in this gala event and the architectural pageants of World Expos as what I like to call them. Basically, uh, World Expos have three main components or participants. One is the host country and uh, the, the state that gets to host it and buy a bidding process. The Bureau of International Expositions, which is an intergovernmental organization that looks after the execution of expos and the natural part, uh, national uh, participating pavilions in the expo site. So the infrastructure of expos was something that I was able to bifurcate in various parts on based on the scale. One on an urban scale and the other on uh, the site specific scales. So these expo sites are also at an average of 500 acres. Uh, Per site, so that's the kind of scale we're looking at here. To study the uh, intensity of expos in the architecture, an intensive timeline was something that I uh, studied. Expos from 1851 to 2025 was studied, and I'm not sure how many of us know that uh, the Eiffel Tower, the Ferris wheel, the Space Needle, the Atomium, and all these various structures were designed to be for a temporary event of six months, but these are yet. Uh, quite intact as permanent structures and tourist attractions across the globe. Uh, this was just the basic uh, table of contents of my research book, which were pointers to all the answers that I had. I would just like to... I have 15 slides only. <laughs> 
So uh, I would just like to talk, focus on the third and the fourth parts where remnant architecture and the forms of legacy is something that I would uh, draw focus on and uh, bifurcate between the remnants and the legacy buildings. And also how many uh, cities that host the expos have to undergo urban impacts to be able to host millions of visitors for a temporary event. The site chosen was of the Dubai Expo 2020 because it being the most recent expo, I was able to closely uh, look at the establishment of it as I. Yeah, uh, so the site was is of 438 hectares and uh, one pavilion is placed right at the entrance of the site as a conceptual prototype. Uh, the question of how architecture of the pavilions is something that people really draw, uh, focus on is what happens to them after the six months. So the first image you see here is the NDRDV pavilion in 2000 for, uh, that was built for Netherlands. That is one structure that is being repurposed right now. But on the contradictory side in Milan, in the 2015 Expo, there were several country pavilions which met the uh, state of uh, demolition or deconstruction or dismantling as uh, suitable. And uh, even for like three years after the expo has been over, these structures yet stand uh, in a state of incomplete uh, fate. So to kind of answer these questions in a conceptual prototype manner, uh, a BIE pavilion was designed on site, which could be easily uh, dismantleable and allow future adaptive reuses on site. The primary idea of the pavilion being uh, able to display all the various activities and the functions of the BIE was kind of held intact for uh, the six months duration of the expo. And after that, it was looked at a housing site to uh, incorporate all the expats and the workers who kind of contributed to the success of the event. Uh, these are just like the plan renders where it shows how the same space can, uh, you know, serve multiple functions of being of being an exhibition space and then being able to uh, convert the architectural structure of the building into a housing facility. So uh, the concept of the pavilion as a conceptual prototype is to allow for the architecture to be adaptive in a way that the future uses of the space can be incorporated. The construction details on how uh, the advancements in construction technology could be incorporated in uh, a simple pavilion building was something that was explored because considering the architectural advancements across the globe, why are the expos such a large event which uh, needs to be dismantled at that large scale over the years? was something that uh, the question here lingers around. And I mean, just to uh, close the loop, the project is yet an ongoing uh, study. It's not that the thesis kind of, you know, puts a full stop to that whole question answer playing. So uh, yeah, getting back to the construction details, the uh, space could also become housing in, in the sense that prefabricated housing models that were displayed on the expo site itself in 2000, 20, uh, 21 actually this year, those could be incorporated in the space by uh, kind of modulating how, sorry. Okay, so, uh, this is the section of the pavilion, which is not a very conventional uh, architectural building with like ramps spiraling around the courtyard and all the uh, green spaces kind of creating the terraces for people to interact. And the fluidity in the cross section is something that pavilion architecture of all the 192 pavilions on Expo this year kind of showcased. So this was like an amalgamation of the experiences that the visitor has at the Expo. Also, considering Dubai as a uh, site, the heat and the dust and the sand are the primary question that comes to one's mind. So how can the architecture itself without additional uh, mechanisms be kind of uh, soothing for the people to inhabit the space? 
and elaborate sustainable ecosystem was kind of uh, devised and energy, water, greenery, uh, smart pavilion and people-centric pavilion. These aspects were looked at to kind of uh, justify how architectural sustainability can be achieved. <laughs> These are construction details on how uh, additional layers of uh, details and interventions can make even a simple pavilion uh, sustainable in a way that it can be used as and when required with multiple functions uh, being incorporated. Another section of what the building would look like during the expo, which is basically this colorful gala of uh, festivities and various displays going on around and people interacting with installations and having that different experience of sorts. So how can this experiential legacy also be carried forward after the expo instead of just dismantling structures down? was something that the thesis kind of tries to look at. And to conclude, uh, this was the uh, Master Plan District 2020 proposal, which is uh, stated by the Dubai government and uh, their intentions of the post-occupancy uh, usage of the expo site. They plan to make it a 15-minute city and a smart city with multiple occupations and allowing people to uh, live the futuristic lifestyle. So that was the intention of District 2020 and just a brief comparison of the master plans of, you know, how the before and after use kind of justifies the use of uh, housing in as a post-expo function for the pavilion. Mm. I would like to conclude this uh, process, study and uh, conceptual prototype project here and would love to have further discussions. Thank you. In that sense, the use of, of, of the space by the species. And, and if you take that position, then how would you look at your head? How would you imagine it? I don't know. I just wondered whether. But then they're actually to record as walls. And you know what I'm saying? Like, let it require use the same way that we require use. I'm just wondering what to repeat on the other view. I don't know. Push to architecture. It's not provoking, though, if you're making something for animal care or welfare. It was because of the client who cannot express any words. I don't know whether I don't know whether it is possible to do many care. So I, I, I find it fascinating that you selected these two projects. Again, one is a kind of a exposition where uh, I think there is so sometimes alien space and completely updated. And on the other hand, uh, something that is that uh, feels so uh, so natural that get alien to this animals over there. So, yeah, I'm also quite surprised now that these two projects are plugged in this. So this is a very good pointer for everybody else here that what was presented on the sheets and how we interpreted versus what she presented it as. 
Okay, so really just so when we saw it, we read what was on the drawing and we talked a lot about sustainability, even issues of green and you know climate. And then suddenly here it actually didn't come out like that. But our reasoning was that we were trying to find similarities between what Aburi presented and the Expo project. So that's uh, that's a very interesting play when you're presenting it to somebody who's external to your school or college or faculty. Uh, how do you communicate your idea as a whole? Okay. Um, sorry, Walter, can you come to me? Yeah, okay, right. Uh, for me, uh, two things which really stand out, and I think uh, the observation was uh, coincidentally very nicely uh, kind of summed up in this um, one of the sheet that says ephemerality with monumentality. I think Aboli's project versus her own project actually depicted that. Okay. Uh, which is quite interesting that in how many ways you could think. Now, the question is also that as a student of architecture or as an, as an architect also, as a creative person in the process of space making, to what extent can you explore the possibility of innovation or creativity? And I think this could answer in some ways what Siri Shiva trying to say that do we need walls and do we need roof? Uh, so let's take an example. Uh, one is the white environment situation, a lot of trees, and one is a desert, open, dry, you know, very urban. What about thinking uh, a space which is subterranean? It is very natural in a wild environment. You don't really have to create a building above ground, if you are talking about animals passing through or you know, like you try to address one issue where you said you would take the road up and the underpass would be created. But what about, let's say, if I were to create an actual controls and create a subterranean structure where the facilities would have gone inside. So even from a visual perspective, it would have given me the continuity of the visual, you know, the space. Just like as it amongst the trees, there is a space that got created. And same thing from a magnetic perspective in Dubai, maybe a subterranean thing would have been an equally good solution. I mean, this is where you could probably stretch your innovativeness or the creativity and try and find a, a pure architectural solution. So that's my uh, take on it. But yes, another very important aspect which is related to the humanity and the monumentality is that there is a conscious effort in Expo kind of a scenario to produce that spectacularness, the star that you are, you, you are now getting into zone of creating an attraction. And that also is a very important factor many of us uh, struggle with, think about, want to be in that zone, want to be seen, what, and it, it has a purpose. It, it, it doesn't mean that it's not correct, but it, it also serves a purpose because you need to attract attention. Whereas in the other case, I think it was not to attract attention at all. We are often faced with this question to build or to not build, even if we are building how much to build. And even if we choose this option of to not build, like he said, it should not be what it should be underground. We are often faced with these questions like is this architecture or is this landscape architecture? How do we tackle questions like these? What do we define architecture then as? In an academic structure like this, where we also have requirements of the university, which Requires certain build up. Are we asking them to rather have anything to respond on that? Okay. Still, so, uh, many of us do, many of us ask. So, um, that now I was just uh, wondering if uh, the building is uh, like the bridge uh, was on the past that should create. So, I was just wondering what should it be even for those who have had similar conditioning that says that maybe. And for it, it becomes natural for the animals to pass through it, and uh, you know whatever that you're doing, that's humanly human intervention, take care of the animals. You know, just you know, they're probably continuing the same language that you want to do in those conditions, and uh, would it allow you a, a kind of a repetition or a questioning of the similar position in that you're in? And uh, maybe we can do this. Allow the 
looking at uh, the grounds again, the above the thing, and uh, we need this entity mentioned. I think the, because you asked the question of the university and its mandate and things like that, I think uh, the university has moved ahead also. And uh, today we have seen many projects which are complex, translate projects uh, in, uh, in an architectural design studio. So I don't think that that, uh, that kind of application uh, needs to be there anymore. At the same time, it's not, it's not about when I'm asking the question, uh, uh, are, are walls clear or is rules required? Uh, I'm not uh, uh, not saying that what you do otherwise is not architecture. I'm saying that uh, there can be, a, a, you still have to create those interventions. You still have to create the, uh, uh, the, the landscape and the modifications in order for the animals to be get protected. So, uh, so that's the risk. And then there is and this complexity in that. It's not that there is there is a key like the technology, there is a, a, so that application you should actually but I, I I have a slightly different uh take on this is that I think also this is very important to understand where your question is coming from because somewhere we are all conditioned to look at space making, architecture, landscape, HGS in a very compartmentalized way. That okay, this is what I should do, and then I should do this, and then I should do that, and then you think that as separate processes. But in my opinion, the whole process of space making is much more holistic. I mean, where interiors, I mean, interiors, perspective, I would say that it's a very more recent phenomenon where you started looking at interiors separate from the space that you're creating because you needed to decorate. But uh, I remember some of our all small, I mean, much of so there is some fantastic work. It was so much integral years. I mean, you didn't need any additional there to say that it's a good space. And similarly, landscape, it is integral to the whole process of space making or architecture and places. I think all of us should look at it, not just in pieces, but in every year that when you pick up a project, look at the way you would like to put trees around or shrubs around or what you want to do inside. This is must be an integral process of design, and that's how we have to it. I think uh, let's take a break. Oh, sorry. I would like to address this mention about so we need walls or it is terrible. I was facing the same issue, you know, that uh, such clerical spaces are required, but then how does one do it? Uh, which requires a kind of enclosure, a kind of, you know, a closed, sanitized space. Which is why then the spaces which require these facilities, these uh, treatment zones, are uh, kept to minimum. And then the enclosures, the post recovery, or even when an animal is caught in there, the uh, maximum part of uh, you know attention given to the animal is in the wild space. Which is why then uh, situating it in a natural uh, landscape was important. So things happen in the outdoor, and only. Uh, Usually, interactive spaces that are required, those clinical areas, were then kept to the built form. Let's take a look at the We meet again near the one copy.
That's my no no no. It's really connected to the screen. Oh, okay. I think it's so. I don't know. Who's our solution? Right. Okay. Uh, can you settle out, please? Thank you. I start. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Amrit Nagpal, and uh, my thesis topic is the Yamuna Collective, uh, which is reimagining and restoring the forgotten riverfront. Uh, so my thesis uh, looks at the 22 kilometer stretch of the river that uh, passes through uh, Delhi between the Okla and the Wazirabad Barrage and how the river has kind of uh, disappeared over the years from the minds and the imagination of the people and just become a dump for the city's excess. Uh, so it started with looking at uh, like the history of how, the, uh, how Delhi has developed and uh, as you can see, uh, Right from the 1640s, it's developed in relationship to the river, whether it was when the Mughals came in or when the first kind of infrastructure in terms of the bridges, you know, was starting to be created. And then all the way up to the 2000s, uh, when some of the most important infrastructure, like the metro stations and your uh, infrastructure for the Commonwealth Games villages, started coming up right on the flood plains of the Yamuna. Uh, so, uh, an inquiry was, um, you know, made into what has led to the state uh, of the river to, you know, become such in the city. So one of the problems was a conflict with development. Uh, so as you can see, uh, the floodplain over the year has kind of been uh, reclaimed and taken up by these infrastructure projects, which don't necessarily interact with the river, but have still been placed there on like this precious real estate, which is uh, a part of the city. Uh, there's also a problem with the accessibility and interaction wherein um, we have uh, various reasons because of which uh, the public is not, uh, let alone interacting, is not even seeing the river through their daily lives. So whether that's the ring roads uh, that are passing um, or, you know, the ghats and the walls or the unauthorized colonies that have come up over the years because of which the public cannot interact with the river. Uh, also, the pollution because of uh, all this infra uh, said infrastructure uh, on the floodplains and uh, other activities. So, um, only 2% of the entire stretch of the Yamuna River passes through Delhi, yet uh, the city is responsible for 75% of its pollution. And um, the cleansing of the waters can only take place if the river is brought back to the people as a part of their daily lives. Uh, so looking at uh, the zone O through which the Yamuna passes and its uh, land use, you can see that uh, there's a high presence of infrastructure uh, projects, human settlements, uh, and not so much of, you know, actual infrastructure that allows the public to interact with the river. Also, a large part of the floodplain is uh, used for agriculture. Uh, so the methodology of my thesis was in the form of a walk along the Yamuna. So uh, this was a walk 
along that stretch of the western bank wherein or uh, different pockets were identified to kind of study and understand the uh, topography of the river so these are just some of the sites that were taken up uh, like starting from the wazirabad barrage or uh, looking at the unauthorized colony of majnu katela some of the markets also looking at the ghats as a typology the rajghat power plant the millennium bus depot which was made for the commonwealth games and then uh, lastly ending at the okla barrage uh, so this is basically a timeline that looks at uh, all the on ground the policy and the legal developments that have uh, taken place in relationship to the yamuna whether this has been uh, you know the dda proposing biodiversity parks or the green tribunal banning farming on the flat plain so uh, what then is the future of the river so uh, there is like an inquiry onto the stakeholders since uh, the river being such a large entity it comes under the purview of various organizations and not just the organizations but various groups of people like the farmers that use it for their occupation or the ghat dwellers that have you know kind of been the first to interact with the river as well as the general residents of delhi Uh, so I looked at uh, the DDA, which is the Delhi Development Authority, uh, has proposed the Riverfront Restoration Plan, which uh, looks at you know creating, retaining walls, boardwalks, these biodiversity parks, institutes for scientific research, etc. Uh, along this 22 kilometer stretch. So a critical analysis of uh, of the plan, or uh, you know, kind of led me to believe that. Uh, this plan is uh, you know not of the people and uh, firstly the ecological restoration of the flood plain is not a sustainable long term solution if the public still fails to interact with the river and secondly the dda has treated the flood plains as a blank slate where they can you know propose whatever they think is appropriate um, which kind of ignores like the existing fabric So here uh, I've added a picture of one of the parks uh, created by the DDA for the Yamuna uh, redevelopment, which uh, lies largely unused. So an alternate imagination was proposed in terms of um, creating green spaces, only allowing public interaction through certain pockets, and using the existing monuments to create trails, which could, you know, become a part of the larger imagination of the river. so this is basically or uh, diagrammatically shows uh, how the ghats can be redeveloped to have softer edges instead of the current concretized ones the drains need to be looked at as like landscape corridors and greenways to stop the pollution coming into the river uh, and also looking at developing brownfield sites so um brownfield sites are sites of infrastructure along uh, the river which are now defunct and you know may or may not be uh, contaminated but are currently not being used so the larger idea was to have a body which kind of interacts with the river the stakeholders and the city so looking at cleaning the river or uh, looking at social action for the marginalized groups as well as the residents of delhi and with the city looking at that kind of prime real estate and forming a public landmark through like income and employment generation uh, so this basically just so uh, looks at the built and the unbuilt programs through which i would like to uh, integrate the site through uh, in public infrastructure and agriculture uh, so the i marked out the site along the flood plain uh, which is the rajghat thermal power plant so this is a coal fired power plant which was commissioned in 1989 and in 2015 was closed uh, due to pollution concerns Uh, there have been numerous proposals for the plant but till date it lies defunct uh, so uh, the idea was to create a change in the vision for the city wherein that power plant which is a massive structure becomes from a symbol of pollution to a symbol of ecological responsibility or kind of delhi's way of looking at um, you know what the future lies ahead um, so this six step kind of a plan was developed um, wherein from the existing site or uh, certain unnecessary infrastructure is removed to kind of increase the amount of green space brownfield remediation is looked at or uh, through like constructed wetlands phyto remediation etc a farmers institute is um, introduced in the form of a krishi vikas kendra 
which allows um, to kind of legitimize this occupation that has been taking place through so many years. Uh, looking at a Yamuna museum, which, uh, you know, educates the public and gives them a platform to, you know, learn more about the river. Uh, creating an urban forest, which becomes like a green lung for the city and uh, incorporating public programs like plazas um, and commercial programs. And then lastly, uh, over the years, once the river cleanup has taken place through landscape interventions, looking at connecting the site to the river. Uh, so the site, uh, which is uh, located right behind the Rajkar Gandhi Memorial, uh, is looked at holistically at a conceptual level, uh, wherein different programs can be introduced to create like a tourist kind of a trail or a corridor, wherein a person can experience everything from Delhi's history to its environment concerns to even the Jal Board STP to kind of understand the technicalities of what goes into this. Uh, so the programs are the City River Museum. Okay. Uh, so this is a synthesis drawing which shows uh, the creation of that kind of public corridor and the adaptive reuse and the introduction of new structures onto the site along with all the landscape features. Uh, so these are some views which show um, you know, the greening of this kind of large in industrial kind of a site wherein you're giving it a completely new way of looking at it. Uh, the massing was kind of done through 3D models and 3Ds wherein the old and the new was brought together. So um, the structural grid of the existing structure was maintained and newer interventions were added to that. So here you can see how an atrium was introduced with a water body, which uh, basically uh, the design stem from uh, passive cooling strategies and uh, ways in which the heat and light load could be kind of reduced in the building. So also looking at creating the pockets of the new elements, which would kind of stand out against the old. So using fly ash bricks as a material because of uh, the excess fly ash, which is uh, readily available on the coal power plant site. And also creating these um, silos in red, you know, which kind of has a contrast to the old structure that is already existing. Uh, again, uh, these are some of the sections uh, that look at the design of the building. Also uh, looking at farming uh, as a program. So one third of the Delhi's floodplains are used for farming. So 20% of the city's requirement is coming from there. So creating uh, the Krishi Vigras uh, Kendra. So, you know, creating like a private kind of a courtyard for the former, uh, farmers with water bodies and internal courtyards, which are more suitable for the programs required for them. So kind of looking at a push towards organic farming or alternate ways of farming like hydroponics and also providing with uh, providing them with social spaces um, for interaction, rest, mm -hmm. etc. Uh, these are some of the views uh, wherein the courtyard could be used for additional functions and kind of again looking at a climatic way of designing the building through the fence and kind of reducing the heat load. Uh, lastly, the landscape and the site services. So uh, this became an important uh, part of the project because uh, the landscape becomes the way in which the site is kind of remediated. So looking at constructed wetlands, looking at uh, the treatment of grey water to kind of deal with the high uh, water requirement on site. And uh, these were some of the architectural details that look at uh, how the old structure and the new uh, kind of come together and these kind of new uh, interventions that have been introduced uh, into this space and also some of the landscape uh, features like the green wall, the water body uh, and the constructed wetland, which uh, kind of become like an important part of the project. Thank you. Uh, he's not here, he's sent a video, so we just look at that. Audio connect here now.
Recycling Device. Mm -hmm. It's not selecting it. Meeting with you today. One Should we you want to go next? We'll do this. So, so hi everyone, my name is Maitri and thanks for getting back. Sorry. Okay. Thank you for getting back and I hope you all don't get bored. So yeah, so my thesis starts actually says that the, the title of this thesis says that re-establishing permanence in transactional livelihoods talks about the whole rethinking of the markets in Mumbai. Oftentimes, the urban designers and the planners fail to recognize the importance of informal spaces in the city. The treaters are static objects. The market is more than merely a location where one obtains food and other necessities, but also embodies the community's unique sense of the place. Markets in Mumbai, both in urban and rural areas, constitute a mosaic of diverse actors and tend to be highly fragments. However, with the changing fabric of the city, certain markets have become redundant. The modern consumer does not want to go out and would just opt for any kind of online format of shopping. Today's time where e-commerce has taken place over, taken over the world, the idea of public realm could further be pursued. Due to the drop of interaction in markets, the collective memory of these communities have been seized. The most salient region of the decrease of this traditional market is the modern people's transform lifestyle and rethinking the roles of the market in an urban structure. The mode and the method the state or the government or the BMC uses for the transformation is not based on the historic, historical or present-day understanding of the people. Markets are getting diminished and so is the public realm. Haphazard development has caused the change in city's landscape and its real estate. So my thesis actually explains what he thinks the role of market in an urban structure as a new type of hybrid model, supporting a new type of social economic development and, re and create a medium for the communities by creating a platform for economic as in the social means. The research is determined by the pursuit of new forms of market, which can contribute more to the city and functional, and functional program corresponding to the demands of the modern consumer. So basically to get to the site and everything, to understand the existing fabric of the comparative study, a comparative study was done. This study was to understand the success and the failures of various market typologies. So these are different markets that have been uh, studied. And uh, basically, out of these different markets, which are actually over the Mumbai, this these are the major prime markets where we get our consume, consumes from. And uh, 
further these markets were again analyzed on the basis of the structure of the market the type the workability public movement pattern and, and the sur surrounding context out of these different markets i actually chose the dr shrodkar market which is in parel and it was the most affected in terms of categories mentioned here and uh, yeah so this market is actually in the f south ward of mumbai which is in parel which is near the elphiston bridge that comes down the shrodkar market is actually located in parel and is the bmc is actually trying to evict the whole local vendors and the guys of redevelopment fish sellers of mumbai's parel market have been uh, taken away from these markets and been re reallocated to different places of the market different places over the bombay uh, the first phase on the work has been begun and this whole redevelopment has been planned in two different phases these are different uh, institutions and this uh, is all over the surrounding a field study was done where a diagram this diagram represents pedestrian vehicle flow with respect to different time of the day where in different activities take place with within the street and surrounding road across this helps to study the nature of commuter and consumer behavior in terms of hawkers and shops with respect to footpaths foot footpath is coming to the site and how it affected the whole surrounding and everything as you can see on the top right the existing market on like the existing markets were broken down and uh, there was broken down and the whole market vendors were made to re uh, reallocate to a different market outside of bombay and if you can see the center in the center that's the redevelopment building that's actually coming up the first floor is the commercial market and uh, the rest of the floors have been and uh, most of them have been uh, for sale for housing and on the left hand side there's a exist there's a proposed market which is in the basement of the new building that's actually very dungent and no light and no ventilation most of the market vendors over there have been complaining say, saying that it's not actually a place to sell goods and anyway. so basically uh, moving on these were some of the analysis and uh, the program that are found on the site well, so looking at the design of the whole uh, building you know different systems that actually came into the process and how these systems actually worked for me to design the whole process uh, the material sourcing from where the materials have been sourced the economical system of the market the cultural system of the place the food networks the administration the communal networks the waste segregation how is the loading and unloading done and what kind of a market can actually become as a night bazaar or something a night market and which will all becomes a hybrid module for the whole market which is a prototype that have been proposed for this market in bombay this is the view of the farm building as you can see uh, this is the ground floor of the building uh, these are the whole site is actually the whole the, the market is actually surrounded by three sides of the road and these are the different there's a main road ahead the elphiston bridge comes down and then there's a one way road at the behind at the back of the building which is a vithal chavan mark uh, looking at the design of the markets how the market has been uh, should be designed or should should be designed actually uh, saying that how the post points actually work there are different post points in the whole building saying there is a community market a public well and different creative community networks urban and public spaces so if you can see these mushroom columns these mushroom columns are designed as a concept for having like an umbrella over the market where the stalls have an umbrellas so this concept of mushroom columns and uh, concept of shade has been coming moving on how the circulation of this market works Uh, the the whole knee, uh, ground floor is actually an open market area where the people of the other locality can come in, and the whole market vendors and the other surrounding area people can actually come in and sell their goods. The right side of the building is the whole commercial market area or commercial shops basically, and it's actually divided, and like the whole uh, markets have been divided into two parts, where the local vendors and the commercial shops will be on the different edges. 
This is the structure of the building. Coming into the different uh, strategy that I have produced for this market, where the waste aggregation has been done. Usually, we don't find markets in Bombay which have waste segregation or other segregation needed in the market and not produced properly or not disposed properly. So this market, as you can see on the behind edge, there's an entry to the market that the trucks can be com coming in and there'll be a loading and unloading desk. The trucks come in from the behind edge of the building. The trucks come in and then there's a they have been there's a platform which kind of waste can be segregated. And then these waste is actually gone, gone into the building and then segregated and then disposed of properly. The first flow actually contributes to the whole uh, market as an individual part where they say they have uh, a Bojnale, uh, a Bojnale, and then again the commercial shops on the top. This section actually shows how the building is. Uh, been treated sectionally and like how the building actually rises up as we go inside the building. On the right hand side of the edge, the building is actually a steel trust building and the whole staircase has been suspended and the people actually move to the right hand side of the building where there's a market area and then uh, the people actually go to the watch tunnel and then again to the multi-purpose hall on the second floor. This is one of the uh, highlighted pictures where they say the whole section has been highlighted. This is the detail of the it's a, the suspended staircase, which has actually been uh, suspended to the truss. Second floor uh, diagram actually shows this. There's a multi-purpose hall as an admin floor, and then the segregation unit. The right hand side where people can actually have the organic waste management done and other segregation zones. So basically, I wanted to have this market as a public realm, which actually gives back to the city and not just consume something away from them and not just give them give their give their land back to them. So basically, have these different spaces, like the same space would have different functions. So basically, an art exhibition could come in that space. Janmashtami could happen there, other different festivities over the year. Ganesh Chaturthi can happen there. A, a whole concert for youngsters and other people who are just coming. A flea market that can actually happen, where people can actually come in. Diwali and other festivities could actually come in and take place in this space. And there's a full publicness to this building. This is, the, this is one of the views. And this is the census diagram. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Jainavi Shah and I'm presenting my thesis titled Rural into Governance, Representation of Indigenous Through Architecture by Decoding the Valley Ontology. Uh, due to rapid urbanization, the Mumbai metropolitan region keeps extending its limits to the urban peripheries. These forces have led to industrial town and supporting infrastructure for the metropolis being located on the outskirts of, uh, outskirts of the cities, leading to the depletion of the ecologies, which in turn affects the indigenous community living in the area. It is common to believe that the city is the fulcrum of all our urban concerns, while the peripheries that enable the city are relegated to architectural afterthoughts. The thesis chooses to engage in a region around 100 kilometers north to the city of Mumbai, uh, populated largely by an indigenous tribe called the Varli. Danu Taluka, due to its close proximity to Mumbai, has been losing its ecology due to rapid transformation over the, uh, uh, over the recent years. And it's an eco-sensitive Taluka since 70% of its forest cover. Uh, it's, it's highly present in current time due to its uh, heavily tribal-dominated area. 
The thesis began uh, with an intent to understand the distinctive identity found by indigenous communities. Uh, but a landscape that looks like this over the year has been transformed into a landscape like this because of the recent kind of transformation and its proximity to the city that we see uh, in, in much force in the upcoming years. Uh, my major part of the research began with the intent to understand that what is this distinctive identity formed by the indigenous communities. It is studied by the interconnected relationships with land and ecology, and it is documented uh, it is documented for the purpose of the research through a Wali community, which is like majorly dominant in the area. Uh, it's a plan of a typical Wali settlement called Retali, which is located in the Daru Taluka. And it particularly maps the change in occupation along the terrain and the dependency on natural resources based on the various occupation that, that the landscape allows them to follow. Uh, so if you can look at the plan, there are small clusters of uh, villages. It's a called it is called paras they interspersed by their farmlands in between and uh, that the terrain is mainly hilly in the region and uh, the topographical section that allows the various kind of occupations that it allows them to offer the forest um, to the forest to the right to the river on the left and the different kind of occupation it allows um, so Pali village is an experiential landscape the east to west movement along the it is explored through a sectional drawing, which consists of a geological section which for details, uh, which maps the walking network and the relationship with the terrain and access to service and amenities. Um, if you look, the terrain is highly hilly in region, but access to services and amenities like hospitals, which are way further away, it's really difficult. And uh, so mapping the daily activities of the community by interviewing people residing within the paras led to an understanding of their way of living in terms of dependence on these forest resources and the community's engagement with the forest ecology and other natural resources. Um, so the act of walking is very important to them because the isolated paras have no access to motorized transport. And um, uh, if I could explain those graphic novels, these are actually interviews taken uh, which describe the different kind of resources they get from the forest itself. If they want toothbrush, ropes to tie the cattle, they don't usually go to the market. It is usually the forest and the surrounding. So they really consider themselves a part to be living with the nature. Thus, nature is not ex um, exploitable. And that is how the idea of sacred groves come. That is why we see that the um, the region is... Okay. Uh, okay. Part. So, yeah, these stories depict how through uh, festivals and how through community things, the idea of sacred groves is still maintained. And uh, these are not primarily conservation areas marked by the government, but they exist for cultural and social reasons. The conservation of many plants and animals in the jungles is a part of their culture em em embedded in uh, by their customs and ritual beliefs, since no animals or plant could be harmed in them. Um, the drawing on the right, it shows a, a typical Wali house. This shows a sustainable, sustainable way of living, building, and conserving in a context like this. And it, uh, so the material palette is largely thatch, reed. It's like a normal curtain wall, which is made up of reeds, and it's plastered with mud. But eventually, when the wall starts decaying after two, three years, it is used as manure for the agricultural field. That's what comes from earth goes back, back to earth. And that is why I say that the true form of sustainability is what they are trying to teach us and we should uh, consider them rather than um, you know gentrifying it for the new purposes okay um uh, the thesis also examines how in the current scenario the technocratic vision for the tribal land are contradictory in nature and often have competing interests and perceptions giving rise to contest contested land multiple projects in the recent year also highlight um the, the, the toilet seam of rural India, um, this is actually pictures taken on site, taken through interviews, which highlights that there's a toilet which has no privacy, which has no drainage light, thus it is abandoned. But it also does not consider that the community is used to uh, disconnect with the nature. But also there's a toilet which is right underneath the sacred tree. Thus, even though it has like water supply because it is in a field, it is still abandoned because it fails to understand the community's perception. Um, so the tribal folklore is mainly oral, 
and thus it is not valued and expressed in the planning process. Eh? And this clearly highlights the disjunct dis between the plan uh, policy makers and uh, the community. To conclude, uh, the project criticizes the current nature of development and tries to reimagine re rural infrastructure such that it proposes smaller interventions that solve the lack of infrastructure while still preserving the ecology and the traditional way of life by improving the quality of common social spaces. Here, the thesis also looks at the smallest form of governance, that is the Gram Sabha, and how it can be activated within the daily routines. Uh, so the site is um, chosen such that the awareness would be activated within the daily routines, integrated within the current, current scale of administration institutions in the village. Uh, this maps. Uh, so before we move to the programs, there was like a basic daily pattern of mapping that was done to decode and translate the Wali ontology from concept to form development. And uh, there are these small patterns which forms like a guidebook while I was designing. Um, there are very small concepts that they have, like how they the fences around the house are actually curvilinear so that the cattle can easily move through the landscape. So these actually, um, the forms that you see at the top, those are actually uh, my interpretation of how their ideas of building uh, is. And these concepts have been used uh, along with the program that came through it. So uh, the program span a series of scales that is Excel, um, extra small, small, medium, and large, from micro programs such as rice meals, sitting spaces, small infrastructure to community activities. Um, okay, so I'll start with the smallest, uh, smallest uh, intervention. There's an exist. Um, so there's this idea of a village node. The paras are so isolated that there's a village shop, which becomes like a regular evening place where people gather and discuss. Um, there's an existing check dam on site that has been used as an annex to uh, the local village shop wherein people can gather. But the check dam also is used as, as a rice mill, which also reduces their dependency on mechanical and like more economical mills that they have to use for like grinding there. It can also be like a small business for them wherein they could use the existing check dam. The check dam currently, um, the canal water is used by the upper class orchard owners, which is on the left of the site, but not to the villagers that actually uh, store the water through the, through the forest. Um, uh, the second intervention is, um, like um, there's an idea of a community well, the idea of bathing together, washing together, using the water source, which is like a common water source for the entire village. So over here, the site naturally uh, was contouring towards the river. There are these existing concrete carts that have been made. But the idea was over here was to, uh, you know, not make a very solid drainage line to every house. But how do we still provide an infrastructure that is needed for the basic amenities? So we are the ideas of creating a pond, which still maintains this um, connect with the river where, where everybody comes together. Um, and uh, on the first floor level, it becomes a place wherein the toilets actually fan out towards the river. So the constructed wetlands then become the concrete carts can then be transformed into these constructed wetlands, which do not, which process the water before it enters the river. And on the topmost level, it becomes like a women's cooperative wherein things like Wali painting, it, it is also like closely accessible to the main road. It becomes like a women cooperative wherein they can make uh, small businesses like jewelry making, puppet making, or even uh, sell the Wali art. Uh, the third program is, it looks at the Gram Sabha. There are these temporary sheds where they, they don't have a permanent Gram Sabha office, but they temporarily create a space wherein the villagers get together. Over here, the site is such that um, there are these steps that are built for certain festivities by the government over there. But um, it is noticed that um, it is uh, during the daily routines that most of them try to engage into discussions because um, their work is uh, really labor intensive. Throughout, after the day, they might not be able to attend a village. So over here, it is imagined that through the fields, the farmers would get gathered during the lunchtime and the steps in the amphitheater would become like an extended seating where the whole village thing could take place. So, um, and the only portion that goes underground is actually um, the seed uh, the seed bank wherein they could store the seeds. And the, the name Varli also comes from this brushwood called Varal, that is how they used to store, the, traditionally they used to store the seeds underground. 
and the the idea of this vault is to create these open semi open spaces which are not very close but also like a large village gathering could take place which opens towards the amphitheater uh, the third idea of using uh, you know religion as an institution of knowledge distribution uh, as clearly seen the values are imbibed through their religious institution of like conserving plants but also it is very important that they also have access to new kind of educational systems so over here i've looked at how temple can be an annex to a youth center wherein we could have um new opportunities like a media plug in that could come in and they could have access to computers or uh, and and like um, so over here there's like a sacred tree which has been engulfed into an orchard farm but the village temple is still retained in that particular uh, corner of the plot um so over here the programs are such that the villagers could still use the temple as a place of festivity but along with that the local priest and the youth center could go, go together so they could indulge in programs like um uh, the sacred grove conservation while also the media center allows access to newer information so it's an amalgamation of the traditional and the new education system uh, just like the weekly market uh, which happens in a much bigger pada so the isolated padas are so scattered that you know the markets cannot be located in every village um, just like the weekly markets which travel from one village to another on specific days of the week uh, the media center would also uh maybe behind a bullock or a rickshaw wherever the road is possible to be traveled on the media center is like a media plug in that goes to these temples and uh just like the weekly market it can go from one village to another so within like minimum resources through the whatever the ngo can provide they can actually yeah you know, spread this awareness that actually all of them deserve and the regional scale intervention it's just a proposal of how these tiny kind of modules within every village would act at a regional scale so this is the mahalakshmi sacred grove which is like a pilgrim mit site for all of them and people from not just this part of the region but other tribes from other region also you know tend to be visiting over here so this was just like a proposal uh, which showcase how the ngo or even the gram sabha at a regional level could pro uh, um process thing it would have things like vocational centers and Uh, NGO led things which which is not possible at a very micro scale of the village um and yeah uh, through the technology studio it also looks at uh, how maintenance is a problem when we look at a material palette like this but over here it says that you know maintenance is not the limiting factor that we should uh, switch to concrete or other materials but rather it over, over here it looks at a system wherein the external uh, it's a panel system where in these external reed protects um the inner water and dog thing but these panel can actually be uh, replaced every now and then so your main building does not fall off yeah that's thank
ג'וני? Hello everyone, this is Manthan Hingo and my thesis is titled Flexible Architecture as a Sustainable Design Approach. Looking at the abstract, with increase in land prices in business districts, the density has increased tremendously. Because space is the most expensive component of a new structure, many architects are looking for ways to squeeze as much as possible into it. This has affected the number of social and cultural spaces provided in the area. Flexibility can become one of the key factors that can help build a sustainable urban life. The thesis looks at flexible architecture as a system to explore how flexible social spaces can adapt to the need for high and low density inhabitation. Further diving into the space crunch in Mumbai, it is found that the sea ward has the highest population density of any ward in the city, with more than 92,000 people per square kilometer. This has led to congestion and overpopulation. The current architecture is in no state to sustain the increasing high density of inhabitants. The site of intervention is Edward Theatre located in Kalba Devi. It is a heritage building and it used to be a landmark for social and cultural activities in the older times. Now due to its dilapidated structure, it's barely in use. The site has many schools, a library, and a cinema in its close proximity. The thesis will focus on three types of flexible spaces, which are shared spaces, reconfigurable spaces, and spaces for unscheduled or spontaneous use. The site comprises of the Edward Theatre and two residential blocks adjacent to it. The private residential blocks are redeveloped at the rear end of the site, leaving the front end for more public functions. An additional theatre come multipurpose space is provided on top of the theatre, and due to the decayed structure of the roof, it is redesigned inspired from its original form of a pitch. A flexible public space is designed in the central courtyard with the theatre as the backdrop. Public functions like the market and the cafe are strategically placed at the corner of the site adjacent to the road junction. Semi-public event spaces are placed in between the public functions at the front and the private residential block at the back. The program diagram highlights the placement of the key functions. This video shows the different types of flexible spaces provided in the design. Starting with the flexible space on the top of the existing theatre, which acts as a space for spontaneous uses. It can be used as a theatre, a performance hall, a space for fashion shows, and an exhibition hall. Looking at the rotating volumes in the courtyard, these can act as an open public space when they are in the closed state. But when they open up, they create an enclosed public space for performances and other functions. Now looking at the market, which also acts as a reconfigurable space. It can become an enclosed gallery, an open gallery, an enclosed market, as well as an open market.
and the last kind of flexible spaces are the shared spaces. They can act as a walkway into the site and a cultural space at the same time. The sliding fold-in doors allow multiple events of different scale to take place at the same place at the same time. This drawing sums up the flexible nature of all the spaces. The multipurpose hall on the top of the existing theatre which acts as a spontaneous space, the reconfigurable rotating volumes in the centre of the courtyard, the reconfigurable market spaces and gallery spaces adjacent to the road, and the shared event spaces. This is an axonometric view of the design highlighting the exterior public edge and the interior public courtyard. The ground floor plan highlights the entry points into the site, the entry to the theatre being from the street on the east, the entry to the cafe and the market being from the road junction, and the entry to the residential block from the northwest corner. These two sections show how the existing theatre extends vertically into the multipurpose hall and horizontally into the public courtyard. These are two horizontal sections which cut through the residential block, the event spaces and the theatre. The elevations highlight the different kinds of facade elements incorporated in the design. These are few rendered views of the project from the outside and inside the site. This is an explorer axo highlighting the different structural components of the building. These are few wall sections which highlight the different kind of slabs, facade elements and roofing elements used in the project. On the either sides, you can see the structural diagram of the reconfigurable spaces. The diagram in the center shows the modifications done to the existing structure of the theater. If you zoomed in details of the foundation, the roofing elements and the advanced slab used in the design. Thank you. Uh, we are going to go to Professor Shah, who is joining us on the night. Hello. Hey. Yeah. yeah. Shashan, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, you have uh, seven minutes. So. Yeah. So, my yeah, can I begin? Hello? Yeah, Shashan, we can hear you. Yeah, okay. So the project title was Garden of Architecture. I'll start with the premise of the thesis and how this thesis was majorly working with the idea of how architecture is being institutionalized in India. And it starts working on the different aspects of the profession in terms of the scale, the differences between the education and the professional life and how there are different disparities which kind of lead to the issues in the current scenario of architecture in India. These are a series of collages which I made to express my feeling towards architecture in India. And just to name them, the first one is the lens of society where a uh, Lens or a bias is created towards the society of what architecture is. Then I go deeper into the organizations like IIA and COA, which govern the architectural values in India. And I try to deconstruct them, understand their perspectives and how they work. Then the next, the fourth image talks about the gap which exists in the profession and education field and how there is a lack of awareness about architecture and good architecture in society. The fifth image is about a critique or presenting my personal opinion of what I think about this scenario and how can we deal with it, what are the concerns, what are the bigger concerns. Going further, there were a series of interviews which were taken by of people who are involved in these organizations or institutions working towards architecture and how I get their opinion about these similar questions and how they see a change needs to be brought up or in what direction and in what perspectives. Then I try to rephrase or reorganize these institutions or provide 
uh, structure for these organizations to work in a better way to facilitate the growth of architecture in India and how to make the society aware. And further, it's a reflection of my personal exchange which I had in Norway and how I felt the difference between architecture in India and in Norway. Moving further, these were the concerns which came up during my research and how they were talking about a disparity or disjunct between the two organizations which exist in India and how there needs to be a multidisciplinary approach about architecture, how there are different fields which need to be involved or integrated in the process of architecture or something which I took forward for my project. The argument which I built up was creating architecture for the sole sake of architecture and not for any function as per initially derived or described. And the whole, whole concept was to build or explore architecture purely for the sake of experience or spaces. The case for the when I start looking into different types of programs I can get into and I broke them down into three major topics, one being collaboration where the programs talk about integrating the two institutional bodies, society and the architects into different programs where they can come together and talk about architecture openly. Then creating awareness in the society about what good architecture is, the architectural values and other stuff. And then reinstitutionalizing, which is basically destructuring the organization IIE and COA of how they can facilitate this movement much better. The project was located in Delhi, Nizamuddin Basti, being one of the prominent area and on the main Lodi Road axis where the current COA office exists. The one thing which was very unique about this process was throughout this process, I followed an artist named Zarina Hashmi, who usually uses the process of printmaking for exploring her ideas and there were series of maps which I created after my site visit in Delhi which I used to call them as memory maps and I used to describe or explore the site with my memory of what the site was the complexity and the densities that were involved and the fabrics which were involved at that same axis and the junction of Lodi Road where my site resides. These were series of different maps which were created to understand those similar concepts. further the print method was taken further into the planning where I used the same method to get into the planning stage where I was looking into the plot and how can I fit in with such a dense basti next to my plot the Nizamun this basti which is also very famous for its urban renewal project recently and has caught a lot of caught a lot of been in a lot of news about its success and I was trying to integrate into such a dense fabric using the print method. So the first is a more concise or a dense way of getting into the site and then destructuring or deconstructing it to loosen it up for the building to inhabit the space. These are a series of diagrams which explain the project much easily. The first one basically showing the location of the plot where you can see the dense basti right behind it, a bridge which is coming right in front of the, the plot. And the next diagram talks about the different landmarks like the Nizamuddin Darga, which is very famous. Sorry, sir, Shashan, you have you have one minute. Yeah. 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 So these are a series of diagrams which explain the process. The same method of print making was followed in plans and and yeah. Going further, this was a longitudinal section cutting through the site, showing the different spaces that were created and how these were more like sculptures and not architecture in terms of form follow function, but they were majorly exploring the idea of experience. These were series of axes of different sculptures which were plonged all along the project. Thank you. Thanks, Sushant. Thank you so much. Thank you, no problem. Yeah. yeah.